Well, hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for coming. Um, it's my great pleasure to introduce Professor Michelle Turtle. Uh, her reputation definitely precedes her, including publications in almost all top five journals in economics and collaborations with many top macroeconomists. Uh, in 2019, she was awarded the prestigious Leibniz Prize from the German Research Foundation. And uh, I had to look this up on Wikipedia, but it, according to Wikipedia, it's given to exceptional scientists and, academ and academics for their outstanding achievements in the field of research. So kind of all disciplines. The prize includes two and a half million euros in research funding, and it's rarely given to economists as far as I could gather. So, so it's definitely a very high honor um, among, among others that, that Michelle has, has received. Uh, she's been at the forefront of efforts to incorporate micro-founded intra-household allocation models within dynamic macro models. Um, and in doing so, she's been able to engage a wide range of big and societally important questions. Uh, just a few examples include efforts to understand the origin of long-run changes in women's legal rights in society, uh, the role of marriage in fighting HIV, and the consequences for economic development of ending polygyny in Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, to the, the first year graduate students learning about dynamic general equilibrium models in the first year macro sequence, I think these papers provide a, a great source of motivation about the kinds of questions that one can use these kinds of models to, to, to think about. Uh, more recently, uh, Michelle has been heavily involved in work studying the optimal government response to COVID. In fact, a paper of hers from early 2020 we were just talking about uh, that looks at the gendered impacts of COVID already has over a thousand Google Scholar citations. Um, so the seminar extends extends that work, and I'm I'm personally very excited to hear it. So, without no without further uh, delay, Michelle, I pass it on to you. Well, thank you very much for this very kind introduction. And thanks for having me. So yeah, I wanna talk about joint work with Titan Along, Matthias Dubke and Jane Amstead Rumsey. And yes, we're following up with this work on, on the initial paper we wrote um, when, the, when the pandemic started um, and kind of thinking about it more carefully in a model. And I'll, I'll tell you a little bit more about the whole project which involves several papers as we go along. Um, so it's about the role of women's employment in this pandemic recession. So, so why women, why gender, um, uh, you know, COVID-19 is killing more men than women, but we want to argue the pandemic recession that followed, you know, that has a bigger economic impact on women. Um, so gender is affected, you know, the, the health part is affecting men more than women, but the economic impact is the other way around. And uh, I want to argue here in this paper that that matters for welfare. It matters not only for the women themselves. It matters for welfare, it matters for policy, uh, but also it matters for macroeconomic repercussions. You know, I'm a macroeconomist, and I want to argue in this paper, we want to convince you that it really has a macro impact. Um, so let me take a step back and show you a picture from a previous handbook chapter I wrote with Matthias um, some years ago. And um, there we showed that regular recessions are largely men's sessions. This is from the United States, and I'm showing you here the cyclical component of hours worked uh, after, you know, from HP filtered data. So, you know, going back to 1960, and the black lines are the men, the red are the women. And what you can see is these spikes, both the downturns and the ups are just more pronounced for men than for women, especially for unmarried men, but also for the married men to some extent. So we did an actual decomposition of, you know, how much of the volatilities in hours worked over the business cycle is driven by men versus women. And again, this is from United States data, but if you take into account, not only the volatility per se, but also the fact that men are working more hours total overall, then you see that men are contributing a lot more of the volatility share over the business cycle. In fact, that's this red number here in the corner, three quarters of all the volatility over the business cycle is driven by men adjusting their hours up and down. So only 25% or 24% in fact by women. 
so and that has given this, you know, other people have worked on this, right? This that's is why recessions are often called man sessions because the men are driving, they're the drivers behind recessions. So we've looked at this in other countries, and it's not just a US phenomenon. Regular recessions or man sessions almost everywhere. So uh, what I'm plotting you here, this is we looked at um, EU data largely, lots of different EU countries, plus we added the US, Canada, and the UK. And then I'm showing you here the correlation of the relative hours, so relative female to male hours with GDP deviations. And so those are almost for all countries, negative numbers, right? So meaning whenever there's an economic downturn, GDP goes down, it's below trend, female hours are above trend. They move in opposite directions everywhere, almost everywhere. So why would a pandemic recession or why would this current uh, situation, the COVID-19 recession be so different? Um, there are really two things to think about, on, or at least two. I mean, there are others, but two that we really thought were important. On the one hand, um, usual recessions are concentrated, for example, in, in manufacturing largely, in construction. Those are sectors where many men work, high male labor share. Well, this time is quite different, right? What were the most affected sectors? Think about tourism, think about, um, you know, any kind of high contact occupation, like, you know, someone providing massage or hairdressers or, um, you know, some retail. Those are quite um, female intensive sectors. So just very different sectors. And then secondly, people's ability to work should be affected by the closed schools, right? The schools by and large across the world, at least for some period of time, were not just the schools, also for smaller children, daycare centers and so forth, were closed for quite a while. Um, and even in most countries now they're reopen, but uh, it's not exactly yet the same level as before. For sure, our daycare, for example, where my daughter goes to, still reduced hours. Um, just one, one example. In any case, the point is that that would affect women, or our hypothesis was, or, you know, that that would affect women more than men. So it's been an evolving project. I men mentioned that on the, um, you know, opening slide. So basically, we started working on this right when the pandemic hit. We thought this got to be an issue. Let's think about it. And uh, that was basically a project based on pre-crisis data trying to extrapolate, you know, together with some theory, uh, trying to assess the likely impacts and consequences of, of the pandemic. Um, so that is the paper Terry mentioned, has more than a thousand citations. A lot of people were following up on the ideas we, we put forth at the time. Then we followed up ourselves with a macro model, trying to really think it through. Um, you know, what are the macro implications? What are the long run impacts? You know, we we'll set some policy options. And that's what I want to talk about mostly today. I'm um, sure you the model and what conclusions follow from the model. And then also what we've been doing is an empirical assessment ourselves, um, trying to analyze a slightly different set of co-authors on top of, you know, Titan and Matthias, there's also Sena Koskun and David Kohl, who are both postdocs here in Mannheim. Um, great people, great researchers. So there, we've been using microdata from six different countries. I, I, initially, we wanted to do even more countries, but it got tricky. I mean, there's all sorts of idiosyncrasies with each data set. So we looked, and plus, if data wasn't available for many countries yet when we started doing this. So then we looked at this microdata to really assess um, the empirical you know, impact to what extent that the theories developed in the model have become true or not. Uh, and most of them have been confirmed, but there are you know, some, some discrepancies. In any case, that was published in the macro annual if people are interested. So I'll talk a little bit about the data from that empirical paper, but mostly I'll be talking about step two here today. Yeah, so what's the, the outline for the rest of the talk? I'll show you very briefly some facts from the pre-crisis data. In some sense, it's already kind of outdated, right? But on another level, it tells us about mechanism of expected effects. So I think it is useful to, to think about that and, you, and see that data briefly. I'll show you briefly some evidence on the actual impact, right? That was from that step three I just mentioned. But then I'll spend most of the time showing you the macro model and then use the model to think about short run, medium run, and also some long run implications. So that's the plan. 
So what are the expected effects based on US pre-crisis data? First, I mentioned that already, um, women work more in high contact occupation. Also, we found they work less in critical occupations. To the you know, critical occupation would have the less probability of job loss, right? Those are the people needed. Since women work less in those, um, that, that by itself would make job loss more likely for women. Then if you're thinking about the school closures, um, fact from the United States, a fifth of all children live in a single mom household. So in fact, a quarter of all children live with a single parent, uh, but most of those with a single parent are actually single moms. You know, if you're a single parent, it's really hard to trade off childcare. Well, there's no one else to trade it off with. So that would make these people uh, quite unable to work at least in that period of real, you know, hard school closures. And that would affect just women a lot more than men, just because by the numbers. But even if you, you know, if you're if you're going to couples, so in fact, zooming in on couples where both work full time, that's forty four percent of all couples with kids. Um, mothers do basically two thirds of the childcare, right? So mothers do sixty percent of the childcare, fathers forty percent. So even if they both work full time. That unequal division would likely continue during the crisis, right? Why would it be suddenly completely different? And then fourth and fifth, those are some facts that could lead to some kind of maybe possible silver lining for working women. So on the one hand, um, job flexibility is quite important for the distribution of childcare. So what we found again in the United States data is that men who have flexible jobs in the sense that they can telecommute, they can work from home, they do provide a lot more childcare, in fact, 50% more childcare compared to those men who cannot. To the extent you believe that job flexibility or specifically telecommutability is here to stay, and I think there's a lot of arguments have been made, a lot of data looking, Nick Bloom has been pushing this and others, that um, there's a lot of expectations both on for employers and employees that they think home office or being allowed to work from home will stay at an elevated level for, for a long time, forever. Uh, and that could then lead to more equal division of childcare, um, you know, just because of this increase in flexibility. And um, specifically because the fathers are doing more, more of the share. And then number five is we found, we've looked at couples, we, we tried to figure out what fraction of couples is of the following constellation. So she has to work on site versus the husband does not. It's right? so a picture a nurse who has to go to the COVID ward and fight you know, the disease. And then maybe she has a husband who is an office worker who can work from home. In that constellation of couples, quite likely it would be that he suddenly becomes the primary childcare provider just out of pure necessity. And in you know, just looking at the distribution of occupations across couples or within you know, couples, we found that about 10%, depending on exactly how you define it, but about 10% of couples, um, would fall into this constellation that the husband would likely become the main primary childcare provider. And that could lead to changing social norms. If there are some couples that have, the father was never much involved with the kids and then suddenly out of pure necessity he has to take over. There's some learning by doing. There's some, you know, maybe you're discovering you like it more than you thought and so forth. And that could have an impact in the long run. Um, so someone asked a question in the chat. Actually, I would prefer people really interrupt it. Um, I, you don't have to wait until the end, but I have a hard time reading and talking simultaneously. So if there's an important question, just ask it. Um, okay, maybe not important. Okay. So let me brief, so right, so, so those are where thought, were our thoughts pre-crisis. So let's look at the actual impact so far. Oops. This, well, in the US, it's clearly been a she session. It's very different from before. So what I'm showing you here is the difference in the rise between women's and men's unemployment at, you know, at the peak of the, the recession, well, peak defined by the unemployment peak, not by GDP. Um, and this goes back to Second World War. 
so what you can see is that pretty much all recessions after Second World War were either there was no gender gap, right, really close to zero in the difference in the change in unemployment rate, or in fact, large negative numbers, meaning unemployment rose by more for men than for women. And then you see the red bar at the end. This is the current situation. You know, this is from May 2020. And there was a, you know, it really sticks out, right? Three percentage point larger increase in unemployment rate for women than for men at that point in time. I'm not saying it's quite as large anymore. Things are evolving every month. Um, it's quite a dynamic situation. But for sure, at the peak of the unemployment impact, it was clearly a she session. Now, it's not just a US phenomenon. In most countries, we find this. Um, is, so here, we looked at the post-COVID lock change again in the relative female to male employment gap, right? So what was the decline in employment for female relative to male? And in most countries, again, it's a negative number, meaning females lost more employment. And if we look at it in terms of hours, same thing. Right? So we can look at both margins. And I think it's important to look at both extensive and intensive margin because a lot of the, um, if you think about, it wasn't just job loss. It was also reduction in hours. So if you, you know, temporarily um, you know, have a childcare situation, you might just reduce the hours. Uh, it, it's not just losing a job. Yeah. And so we showed, we see here, uh, this is now going back just to the United States because there we have really good monthly data, the CPS, right? That's one of the best labor force surveys. And here I sh I'm showing you that childcare appears to play really an important role. So what this picture shows, um, the change in the gender gap in employment from the outset of a recession, and I'm contrasting the great recession after the financial crisis with the current pandemic recession. The pandemic one is the, the solid lines, the great recession, the dashed, um, dashed lines up here. So in the pandemic recession, especially for those with kids, which is a solid red or brown line down here, huge decline in relative employment for female relative to men. Well, not so much if they don't have kids, there's not much, you know, it's kind of more, much more stable. For sure, there's not this large gender gap. And then um, if you look at the, the Great Recession, it was totally different. It was, in fact, the opposite. From the outset of the recession until 15 months into the recession, it was the women who were, relatively speaking, gaining employment. So the opposite. Michelle, can I ask you a question <clears throat> regarding sure. the So what, do you know what happened to the labor force participation? Because you know the labor force participation has been declining in the United States, and I was just looking yesterday at this list, and there has been a huge drop. So, do you know if it is more women, men? Uh, is it being because of discouraged worker retirement? Do you have any sense? Of yeah, yeah. So we think. I mean, so this is employment. I'm looking at both, basically, the un moving into unemployment and moving into out of the labor force, right? Um, but absolutely, I think a large chunk of that is people leaving the labor force, women leaving the labor force. Um, so we didn't make that distinction, but um, it, I think it, it does play a big role. Okay, okay. So then the question I wanna ask is, is a she session just the opposite of a men's session? Maybe it doesn't matter. Maybe, you know, we're macro or I'm a macroeconomist. We, you know, who cares who's losing their jobs? Someone is losing jobs is a bad thing, but if it's men or women, you know, maybe it's just labeling, who cares? Well, no, I wanna argue that's the wrong way of thinking about it. There is a qualitative difference between the behavior of women and men's labor supply. In general, women's labor supply is actually more responsive to shocks that's been well documented in many contexts, right? On the individual level to idiosyncratic shocks, there's quite a high elasticity of labor supply for women. So if women are, for example, um, dropping out or leaving the labor force in the medium run, then you know this sort of responsiveness to shocks would be on the aggregate, will be changed. Um, also women's labor supply is very responsive to the within couple wage gap. Um, that's also been shown. So, but then together, this means if women aren't, you know, working as much or dropping out, 
the, for example, the role for family insurance is diminished because men aren't as responsive. They cannot as easily make up if a woman loses a job um, because they're, for example, already working 100% full time. A woman loses a job, it's harder for the husband to work more hours. The other way around, if a woman is working half time, the husband loses a job, she can increase her hours, at least in that situation. So it is qualitatively different. And so then we use a quantitative model to try to make that point so and to really assess this also quantitatively. Yeah. Going back to this point, so you're thinking about uh, the pandemic recession creating some permanent effect because we can think about, you know, the responsiveness can go back immediately after the recession while you are thinking something might really st structure a change in the way in which childcare, uh, so. Yeah, you know, so exactly. So I want to try to argue that there are quite some permanent effects uh, yeah. or at least persistent effects. So for example, and I'll go through that in, in a lot of detail, but um, well, if I have time, let's see, <laughs> but um, one effect, for example, I mean, it's endogenous, this permanent uh, or persistent effect. So think about, you know, human capital, there would be some depreciation in human capital if you drop out of the labor force. And so that itself can lead to persistence, then, you know, maybe the within couple wage gap widens. And then, uh, you know, even after the pandemic is over, they will make different choices than before. So that's one example. Now we be some other persistent effects as well. And I'll get to that hopefully. Uh, we skip the literature in the interest of time. Um, of course, there is some, some analysis of female labor supply over the business cycle pre-COVID that we're building upon. So let me jump straight to the model um, and do ask questions, you know, if there's anything unclear about the setup or the model or the, the assumptions. Um, but so we have men and women and we have single and married. So single and couples, um, that's fixed, that's, that's a type. So there's no divorce. Um, children, we call them K for kids. Children are just really a child care need. So children are time sink, you have to watch them. Um, we're abstracting from any human capital development or education. Um, obviously closed schools also disrupted the learning activities of kids. That's in other papers. That's not in our model here at all. This is about the parents and the labor supply. Um, the labor supply is, is provided on the mostly extensive margin, but we're allowing for part-time work. Um, so you can either not work, work part-time or full-time. Um, it's a labor search model and there are job destruction shocks. So if you lose a job, then you can search again. Um, there are no jobs of different quality. All the jobs are the same. Now, there will be wage differences, but that's driven purely by human capital. So age for human personal human capital. And that is to some extent endogenously accumulated in a following sense. If you work full-time, it can appreciate. Sometimes, you know, you learn something else, you get a promotion, you become partner at McKinsey, you get tenure, you know, there you just become a better worker and hence your wage goes up. Um, or, well, and that cannot happen by assumption if you work part-time. Part-time, you're kind of on a no career track. And if you don't work, then it can even depreciate your human capital. Uh, you're losing you know, connections, you're losing skills, you're forgetting how to work. I mean, it's been widely documented that that happens. Um, okay, then the occupations differ by telecommutability. So whether you can work from home or not, that is a feature of an occupation and people differ by that. And that is important because, you know, telecommutability makes it watching kids much easier, right? Not perfect, but um, somewhat easier. Then we do have a division uh, of labor in the household being partly shaped by a social norm. So M here stands for modern. If you're a modern couple, M is one. If you're a traditional couple, M is zero. And if you're a traditional couple, we think about there being basically a utility penalty if the husband does more childcare than the woman. Uh, sometimes you need something like this to even be able to explain pre-pandemic data. There's a lot of um, you know, couples where the, the woman makes more per hour and yet she's watching the kids most of the time. So it's pretty hard to explain that in a model purely based on financial considerations. 
Then we're going to think about aggregate states that being four different kinds of aggregate states, namely normal, recession, a pandemic recession, and the new normal. So the pandemic recession, we do want to contrast that always with a regular recession, just to make the point how different it is. And then the new normal is to, to think about the persistence of the effects into, you know, after the pandemic is over, but there being sort of a legacy in the labor market. Let me be very clear, this is not an infection model. So pandemic recession here is really just a shock to labor markets and childcare needs. In other work, I've been working on the infection and the disease side, as many other people have, uh, but here we're focusing on the labor market. Okay, so a little bit more on the evolution of the state variables. Um, marriage, as I said before, is a permanent type. There's no divorce. Children, they do arrive and leave according to some probabilities. Um, and also singles can have kids, right? Remember, there were a lot of single moms in the data. And so this is important to have kids basically grow up, right? First, you have a toddler, then it becomes a school-age kid, and eventually the kids leaves the household. Um, so we need some transitions there. And basically, if, if you have a kid that's, you know, above, I forgot now exactly the cutoff we, we chose, but I think 17 and above for, from the purpose of the model is like you have no kid. All right, these, these kids can watch themselves or they eventually leave the household. Um, then employment opportunities, they rise and vanish with some probabilities and offers can be rejected. But the reason you would reject the offer is because you don't wanna work at all not because you're waiting for a better offer, okay? These all, they're all the same in that sense. Um, so you, but you can reject it because you're thinking maybe your husband is making enough money, you'd rather enjoy some leisure or your wife is making enough money or because maybe you're a single mom and you suddenly have a shock to your childcare needs and you just can't work. Um, so there are different uh, reasons why you can reject, you will reject the job. Um, and yeah, the human capital, I mentioned this before, we're modeling, or maybe I didn't mention the details, but we're modeling it on a skill ladder. So there's just, you know, it's a grid and it is a probability of moving up and down. And that depends on your labor supply, right? If you're working full-time, you can go up. If you're working uh, part-time, it just stays constant. If you're not employed, it can go down. That's it. Um, and then the occupations and the social norms can also change according to some probabilities. But think about this more a technical thing. This is small. By and large, if you have a, work, a job in which you can work from home, you'll stick with that. If you're a traditional couple, you'll stick with that. There's just some small chance it could change. Um, OK, questions so far? No, good, OK. Quick question about the occupation. The occupation, so the wage is gonna be the same, just you can do it at home or not. That's something that is independent on experience, age, or et cetera, right? As I can see from there. So wage, we have the wage per unit of human capital, that's just the same for everyone, mm -hmm. but then the human capital is different. It's different, right? of course. But yeah, it's not that the, occup the occupation is really just whether you can work from home or not. It has nothing to do beyond that with wages. Uh, and whether you can work from home or not, that will matter for the childcare constraint that I'll show you in a second. Um, yeah. Uh, okay, so here's a decision problem for unemployed singles. This is really the simplest case. You're single, you don't have to trade off with anyone. You're unemployed, you don't have to make an hour's choice. You're not choosing really all that much. You have to just choose how much to consume, how much to save, right? This is a dynamic model. You think about the future. Um, you have to choose your, well, in terms of time allocation, you can spend time either watching kids or in leisure, but there isn't really much of a choice. There is no choice. You have to, if you're single, you have to put a particular amount of childcare time on your kid or kids, which is given exogenously, right? So T is a childcare time. How much you have to put is just a number that depends on how old are your kids, or whether you have any, if you don't have any, you don't have to put any time. And what's the state of the world, the aggregate state, the X. If you're in a pandemic, this number will be higher. If you have younger kids, the number will be higher. And then you just put that amount and the remaining time will be leisure, that's it. 
It's a very simple problem for unemployed singles. If you're an employed single, it gets a little bit more interesting. So now, in look at this middle constraint. This is the child. This is the time constraint again. And now you have this extra new term in red. This is now um, where the telecommutability comes in. So first, if you have a job in which you can't work from home, this it just disappears. It's zero. So, but if you can work from home. We're saying you're getting a little bit of extra free child care time. So some fraction N is how many hours you work. Remember N can be, well, not working at zero or half time or full time, right? There's only three choices. But a fraction of that work time, you can then simultaneously work and watch your kids. And how much? That's this theta here. Um, no, not theta. Pi, phi, phi, sorry. It's a phi, I think. Um, and that's a it, it also depends on how old are your kids. So if you have a toddler, you can basically do less than if you have an older school age kid that needs a little bit less input. Uh, and yeah, so that makes that childcare constraint a little bit more interesting. And then of course, also if you're employed, you're choosing basically hours work, but remember hours is just three, three, three options, but that's the end here. This is how much you're working. And if you look, the, the n is raised to the theta, and this basically allows for some nonlinear returns uh, from working out or long hours. So it could be you know, that you know, there's some increasing returns from working long hours, but it could also be you're getting tired and there are decreasing returns, and we'll let the data tell us what the theta is. Just a quick clarifying question. So you can have only one kid that age over time. Right, you cannot have two kids or multiple kids. Yeah, so we're thinking about that the time constraint is driven by the age of the youngest child. So if you have a toddler that requires a lot of time, who cares that you've also a teenager around? That's kind of how I want you to think about that. Because I was thinking if you have two kids and you have a 17 year old or 15 year old, and then you have a toddler, the 15 year old can take care of the toddler, so it can help you. So thinking about it goes in shapes in the other direction. I don't know if it is possibly, that. but yeah. if the 15 year old is stuck in home virtual homeschooling, cannot yeah. watch the toddler, and you have to deal with the, the okay. teenager on top of the toddler, it might be worse, right? So it's not clear which direction that goes. Um, but yeah, no, so here we, we kept it simple. We're just thinking about the age of the youngest child. Um, okay, so now let's move on to the couples. Well, okay, no. Before the couples, just a decision problem at the start of a period. There you just have to decide who, if you have a job offer, whether you take it or not. If you don't have one, there's no decision to be made clearly. Um, so that's kind of straightforward. Okay, so now let's move on to the, to the couples. So here's a dual earner couple. So basically a couple with two job offers or continuing jobs. They're maximizing um, the, the sum of utilities with some bargaining weight lambda here. So there's a cooperative couple. They are, they're not fighting about it. They're just choosing together. Um, now the time constraint here, let's look at this um, second constraint again now becomes even more interesting, right? He, she can provide childcare time, he can provide childcare time. Well, depending on if he or she can telecommute or both maybe or neither, they have you know, different amounts of free childcare time. Uh, so that makes the child, uh, the, the division of labor in the household or in childcare time quite interesting then. And so they're choosing Right, they're maximizing joint utility to optimize this. But then we have this social norm here. This is the red term, right? So if they're a modern couple, the term disappears. If they're a traditional couple, you have this utility penalty here. And it increases in the gap in childcare time. The more he does relative to her, the larger the penalty. Even if he does less than her, but as long as he's doing some, there is some penalty, basically. He might still do it if her wages are higher than his, or if he doesn't have a job offer, but they're incurring this penalty. Okay. Can I ask and a then, clarifying question really quickly? Sure. Uh, 
I assume I know the answer to this, but I just want to make sure. The T raised to the M here, this is M just as a marker for men instead of M being the the modernness parameter. Yes, yeah, correct? sorry about that. You're okay. right, okay. We're using the M in two different ways. That's just M as in male and as different from the M for modern. You're right, sorry. Okay, just wanted to make sure. I figured. Yeah, Thank okay, you. good. Um, yeah, okay, and now we go at the beginning of the period, and they just have to choose again which job offers, if they have any, to accept, right? Now there are many different options. If they both have a job offer, they can both take it. Neither can take it, unlikely, but could happen. Um, he takes it, she takes it, right? There are four possibilities. Um, okay, so that is the setup, that's the model. Um, questions on the setup? Michelle, Michelle, does it assume, do you just assume it's like a, a, an infinite horizon problem? Yes. State yeah, yeah, yeah. Or, yeah, okay. I should have said that. Yeah, exactly. So we wrote everything here in recursive formulation, right? That's the value function. And then here we have the V tilde as the continuation value. And it assumes um, it's an, yeah, it goes on forever. Um, we, yeah, that's right. People don't even die. Um, no, people live forever. Um, so the pandemic is sort of permanent as one, or, or it's not because you no, can no, transition no. out of the pandemic. Does the aggregate state evolve? Exactly, the aggregate state will evolve. Exactly. Okay. Um, I'll I'll talk about that in a sec. Actually. Okay. So. And yeah, and by the way, no, I think we did have, we did put in some deaths, right? Just to keep it uh, moving. So there will be new people entering the model and some people exiting the model as well. I mean, in a standard way. Okay, so then we calibrate the model to US data and the moments we're matching are related to the facts I described at the very beginning. So, well, and some other facts. Um, so for example, in data, we know there's a gender wage gap. We're trying to match that. In the model, there are two forces, two reasons for the gender wage gap, an exogenous part and endogenous part through the human capital accumulation. Then we match the division of childcare among dual earner couples. This fact that I told you in the beginning that uh, even if they both work full time, he, she does about 60% of the childcare. Um, the labor supply of married women, as in among married women, there are quite a few working part-time only. And so that whole distribution of not working part-time, full-time we're matching, the labor market flows in normal times, and also estimates of returns to experience and skill loss in unemployment, right? That is very important, the skill loss and returns to experience for thinking about down the road, predicting this persistence part that Alessandro was asking about. Um, then in the interest of time, Maybe let me skip the details of the calibration, right? That was sort of an overview, what kinds of facts we're matching. I could show you all the numbers if people are interested, but maybe a better use of time to just show you some results. And, and if people want to see the numbers, happy to talk about it. Um, but let me be very clear now what the thought experiment is, right? What is a recession in the model? So we're contrasting, as I said, two different recessions. The regular recession in blue, remember the color coding, all the pictures I'm gonna show you, blue will be regular recession. And the pandemic recession in red, that is the pandemic, yeah. That will be, again, in the pictures in red, the pandemic recession. A regular recession, we're just assuming an exogenous change in men's job destruction rate and job finding rate. So the, the probability of getting this, job offer will be lower and the probability of finding a new job will be also, um, sorry, finding a new one will be lower and that you're losing a job you have will be higher. On top, and that's for men. And then for women, we are assuming it's only just half as large. Why half? Well, to, to get this fact that I was describing before that regular recessions are largely men sessions. So we're not modeling the details that, you know, they have different occupations, women are working in different kinds of jobs, men in construction. So we're not, we're just saying they're facing a different job finding and destruction shock process. And then um, the aggregate state, that is also an, um, it's a stochastic variable. 
you'll move into a recession and each period there's a probability it will continue. But then the results I will show you is one that lasted exactly six quarters. Um, right? So people don't know when it would end, um, but then we can simulate one that does end after six quarters. And then the pandemic recession, uh, well, we'll for the men, well, first we assume it's the same. We want to keep it very comparable, right? Then we can see how much this childcare situation basically contributed to the situation by kind of keeping the basic shocks for the men identical. For the women, we're, because of the different sectors being affected, we're now saying the women also have the same large job destruction shocks and finding rate shocks as the men. So that's the first difference between regular and pandemic recession is number one here, that now suddenly the women are also equally sort of hit, forgetting about kids, right? That just the shocks themselves are equally large now for women. Then on top of that, we're assuming childcare needs go up. So by many hours, you know, schools are closed. Small kids need to be watched full time now, essentially. And, you know, big kids need quite less time, but they're also quite time intensive. Um, and then number three, and this is also getting a little bit uh, or an answer a little bit to some of the questions asked early on, I think by Alessandro maybe, um, on what would cause the persistence. So I answered at the time, it's about the human capital. And that is still, that is there for sure. But on top of that, we're feeding in two other changes that we assume are persistent. Namely, this telecommutable jobs, we're assuming it just stays at an elevated number of 30% of all jobs up from 8% um, are now telecommutable forever after. And also we're assuming that the social norms change and making fewer couples have this utility penalty. What's the rationale behind that? That is, as I, I showed you before, there is this small but you know, significant fraction of couples where the husband suddenly has to do most of the childcare. And the idea is that that will have a persistent effect, possibly even through um, you know, externalities, role model effects affecting others. And such an effect has been documented in other contexts. So I don't know if people are aware of this daddy month literature. So many European countries introduced parental leave over the course of the last two decades, parental leave extra month if father's taken. So basically a subsidy for male childcare. And then, you know, empirical economists have used that, um, you know, with some clever identification strategy, often there was a difference across states or different in the timing to see what happened to those men who, who were treated, who were exposed to this regime change. And they find that these fathers are more involved with their children, even down the road, even 10 years after. And so we thought quite similarly, it could be that the fathers who were suddenly forced to do more childcare, will, that will have a lasting impact on them. And hence there will be more couples that are modern. Um, okay. So that's our thought experiment or our, or our computational experiment, I should say, that we're feeding in these two types of recessions. Okay, so first here, so I'm gonna show you a bunch of pictures like this. In each picture, I'm sure is, is a time series of what would happen, right? Zero is um, you know, pre-pandemic. And then starting from period one or first quarter, that's sort of the first recession quarter. And then um, here I'm showing you 20 quarters into the recession, but I'll also show some other pictures where we're looking at even more long run effects. So some figures will have actually um, years on the axis. Um, so here, as you might've expected, the relative the hours worked, right? So I'm showing here ratio of hours worked women to men really drops in the pandemic. So the red line goes down big time. Um, and in the regular recession, the opposite would happen. Um, relatively speaking, women are working more. And, and that is aligned with the empirical evidence I started with um, in the beginning of the talk. So this feature, this relative employment matters from a macro perspective in the sense it really deepens the recession. So the pandemic recession is just deeper because these childcare needs force people who wouldn't have lost their jobs, but they just force some to, um, to not work. 
And of course, the, the shocks are just larger, I mean, more on an aggregate level because the women are also impacted, um, right? So it's, or impacted a lot more than in regular recession. So that together just deepens the recession. Michelle, going back to the previous, so how much of the reduction in the supply is endogenously due by the fact that now they decide to stay at home and how much is accounted for by just a higher probability of job destruction? Yeah, that's a very relevant question uh, that I should know the answer to, but we're working on a new version right now and somehow we never did that decomposition. So yeah. unfortunately, I don't have an answer for you, but, uh, but it's, I should have, so. Okay. We, I'll look at the, look into it. Yeah. Does the model yep. quantify the role of government policy in in like if there's unemployment uh, generous unemployment insurance that increases the benefit of not accepting a job or other? Yeah. No. So good question. So we kept um, unemployment insurance here constant. So there is some fraction of your wages gets paid always. Um, and then and we wanted to, to, even though it's about the US, but we wanted this to be a stylized model to help us think through many different countries. That's why we didn't put actual policy responses into the model because they we're very, very different across countries. Um, but in principle, one could, of course. Um, but yeah, what I'm showing here, there is no policy response. And that you're absolutely right if, well, it depends on exactly what policy you have in mind, um, it, but it would change the numbers, obviously. Okay, so women are doing most of the extra childcare in this pandemic recession in our models. So uh, here it's labor supply in terms of weekly hours worked. Mothers reduced the hours worked from about 25 hours a week to just about 50, 16 maybe here. Um, so that drop, you know, is driven by largely by, you know, increase in childcare needs. Uh, fathers also reduce hours. Well, and some is job loss, right? This is always both. I'm showing you the total. Um, but if you look at the, you can, of course, get a difference by looking at men and women without kids. And the effect is much smaller, right? So, yeah. Um, since Terry was asking about government policy, so this is something that has something to do with government policy, with the potential for government policy, fiscal policy specifically. I want to talk about spousal insurance or lack of spousal insurance. So in a regular recession, um, it's the wife's labor supply specifically actually increases when a crisis hits. And that's what we usually think about as spousal insurance. Um, she's upping her hours when the husband loses a job. In a pandemic recession, it doesn't happen. And this is even, wait, so here I was looking specifically, I should have said that, at those wives that work part-time pre-crisis because they have the most scope for providing this insurance, right? If they're only working part-time, they can easily increase their hours. So now let's look at, again, still these part-time working wives in a crisis, but separate out whether a husband experienced a job loss or a husband did not experience a job loss. Because the spousal insurance is of course only relevant if he lost a job. And so that's this, the right half here. In a regular recession, if he lost a job, her hours go up big time from you know, 20 to 32 or so hours. So there's a lot of insurance going on in that way. And in the pandemic situation, that is just not quite happening or, or much less so. Um, mm -hmm. And that is, you know, largely because she, she may have also lost a job or maybe she was, you know, yeah, maybe they have the social norm that even if you lose a job, she doesn't, she still wants to do the childcare or she's still supposed to do the childcare in that family, right? So there are different reasons why this is not happening. Now, coming back to the fiscal policy argument, this lack of spousal insurance, less of scope for spousal insurance, leads to elevated marginal propensities to consume. So we compute it in the model, right? What's the MPC? And in the pandemic recession, these numbers are just higher than in a regular recession, and they stay elevated for longer. And the reason is precisely because on average, these families are poorer. There isn't as much insurance going on. 
And that would lead to more room for fiscal policy, right? The elevated MPCs means, you know, larger impact of fiscal policies. So, so that's one connection to policy. Um, now, let, let me come back to thinking about gender equality. What does it mean for, for in particular, the gender wage gap, for example? So here again, I'm showing the same time frame, 20 quarters. The gender wage gap widens in the pandemic recession big time. Um, and in regular recession, in fact, it narrows. Right? So it's a gender wage gap, but really I'm plotting here is the wage ratio. Right? In normal times, it's about women for every you know, dollar a man makes, women is making about 80. And then in a regular recession, it narrows. She's making almost. 83% of his do you know, dollar. And it's been actually empirically documented that does, it is true empirically that in usual recessions, the gender wage gap narrows. And we see the opposite here for the pandemic recession. And it's not just selection as in who works, which women are staying in. Um, if you look at the human capital gap, right? Looking at everyone, that in fact widens a lot and stays even wider, even longer. Um, why does it stay wide and longer? Well, here it's you know the most productive women entering first, and that narrows the gender wage gap by this composition effect. Versus sort of the true potential gender wage gap stays actually wide longer. Yeah. So in the last few minutes, let's think about the long run effects on gender equality and and think a little bit about some policy counterfactuals. Um, but yeah, I was motivating this change in social norms uh, already by this daddy month. Another way of motivating it is with this um, email that we received from a woman who was reading about our paper in the newspaper. Uh, I mean, it's just an anecdote, but I think it's, it's quite an interesting quote. So she writes, I just wanted to say I was excited to see your paper. My husband is a dentist who was never much involved with the kids. And he has transformed to a stay-at-home dad for the past five weeks. So this was pretty early on in the crisis. We got this. While I can continue to work, the effect on our family has been profound and life-changing. And it would have never happened without a global pandemic. So for sure, the social norms, I think, in this family were changed. Um, I mean, she's saying it has profound and life-changing effects that sounds like it would last, outlast the pandemic. Uh, and we think there are more couples like this. Indeed, in the model then, there is a rise in the share of couples where the husband does more childcare. It goes up from 24% to almost 30% or so in the long run. So it's huge, but uh, it's not like the world will, you know, stand on its head, but, you know, quantitatively it's a sizable increase. And that actually, now let's look at the labor supply in the very long run. 50 years is on the axis here. And again, I'm plotting the ratio of hours worked of women versus men. And in this very long run, there's an overshooting. So in the pandemic recession here, after about five years, labor supply goes back to relative labor supply, goes back to normal. And then it goes to higher than it ever was before. Uh, what's driving that? It's both our assumption on the increase in the share of telecommutable jobs and also the change in social norms. We decompose it. Each of them by itself would lead to an overshooting, uh, but of course they do add up. And not linearly, by the way. So the red line is not the sum of the purple and the yellow line, but you know, so it does add up, but not you can't just add it up in a linear way. Uh, and that will have an effect on the gender wage gap also in the long run but that's a much more slowly moving variable. So the gender wage gap here, it takes in our simulation, it takes about 20 years to reach back to normal, just because the human capital depreciation now is quite persistent. Uh, and then, you know, in the long run, you, you actually see a narrowing of the gender wage gap, but as I said, it just takes quite a while. There was another question? No, okay. Um, in the last few minutes, I want to talk about the importance of teleworking. Empirically, we actually find a large change, a particularly large change in gender gaps and hours worked for those 
who cannot work from home. Or put differently, if we're focusing only on those who can work from home, we find hardly any change in the gender gaps in hours worked, and that's for the US and for the UK where we have that data. Even among those with school age children, if you can work from home, that seems to protect job loss even for working parents, even controlling for industry and occupation, okay? There is an important caveat to that, which I think this picture really nicely illustrates. This is from a New York Times cover or the cover of a, the work section or something, um, right? So the, the question here is who's on a work call right now? Well, the answer is the woman, right? So he is sitting in his nice home office. She is talking to her coworkers while, you know, helping the kid in the bathroom. So, and indeed we find this, well, not the bathroom part, but sort of in general, the idea that you're doing uh, work and child care simultaneously, we do find that a lot more for mothers than for fathers in Dutch data. So here, this was at the height of the crisis, right? In April, 2020, we asked, we added a question to an existing survey and asking people, what fraction of your home, working from home time were you also responsible for childcare? And among those parents with, you know, kids, depending on the age of the kids, let's look at the school age kids here, six to 14 years, three quarters of the time, women were, while they were working, also responsible for kids. Now, for the fathers, was still 58%. It's still large, right? It's hard to work while, you know, dealing with your kids. But still, there's a sizable gender gap. So, you know, this working from home may be kind of a silver lining for women, for working mothers, but it could also possibly lower productivity if they're in charge of all sorts of other things while working from home. And in fact, this clash between work and childcare has been documented in other work, um, right? So there's evidence from studies, for example, by measuring productivity in academia, right? Number of research papers being written um, and, and that has really taken a big hit during the pandemic compared to, or at least there's a gender gap in that specifically for those with kids. Um, Adams, um, Abigail adams Prussell documented in a very interesting empirical paper using data from Amazon Mechanical Turk that women just face more work interruptions while working from home than men. And it's not surprising they have a lower wage and you know productivity um, will be lower. Uh, measured productivity as in, you know, productivity per hour, right? So if working from home reinforces the traditional division of labor, well, then the gender inequalities might not decline in the long run. So that's a little bit the caveat I want to um, point to at the end. We think, you know, our main model predicts there would be a decline in the gender wage gap in the long run, but, you know, maybe not. <laughs> Yeah, so what are the main takeaway lessons? Um, I've tried to argue that the impact of women in childcare are really the key distinctions, one super important distinction between the pandemic and a regular recession, and that those features contribute to larger employment losses and hours reductions, and that this matters for obviously the evolution of gender equality, but it matters beyond. It also matters for fiscal policy responses. I've showed you these elevated NPCs. It may also matter for the recovery. So vacancies are currently hard to fill in the United States, I've heard. Well, perhaps partly because childcare is still unreliable. Someone was, I think it was Alessandro was asking earlier about, you know, people just leaving the labor force and not wanting to work. And that can be related to these features from our model. So then I'm done. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Michelle. Uh, I can open it up um, to questions. Let me let me stop sharing. I, I've got a question, um, Michelle. What data set did you say because that that you pulled this data from? And then have you looked at the PUMS data to get similar type of data for male and female head of household and such? So, what's the name of the data set you were describing? The PUMS, the public. Use oh, the PUMS. Yeah. PUMS. Yeah. yeah. No, so for the US, we use CPS data. 
Uh, so is, the that, policy, is that part of U.S. Census Bureau data? That's a regular monthly labor force um, survey. I think the pulse is an add-on to that, I think. Okay. Um, where well, they I ask additional, yeah, I'm pretty sure the pulse was an additional um, supplement where they ask more time use questions and so forth. But so I, I was just focusing on the labor supply here and that the CPS has, has very good data on that. Yeah, yeah. It may be interesting to look at both data sets simultaneously. You might be able to feed and get a richer data set, but I'm gonna yeah, go look at your data set because I just mostly spent their time with puns with for gender and eth ethnic differences. But thank you. Yeah, yeah, we are looking at that. In fact, right now, my co is crunching the numbers. We're looking at the pulse survey as okay. we speak. So thank you. Okay. Thank you. I think there's a bit of a miscommunication there. Harvey, you were talking about PUMS, P-U-M-S, right? Not the pulse survey. Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, I misunderstood. OK, PUMS. Yeah. PUMS, P-U-M-S. Yeah. What is that? Oh, the I well, pums that's part of the U.S. Census Bureau, and they they survey households in every you know census block in the country, and it's, it's up the to public use right micro now. data series. Yeah, but if you're talking about IPUMs, they're reading in the CPS data as well. Right. Yeah. Well, I'm going to go try to reconcile the two data sets. They, they okay. could, we could have some a lot of overlapping information. It might be the same as what I'm saying. Yes, yeah, <laughs> exactly. I got to go check. Thank you. Yeah. There is IPUMS CPS. Exactly. I've worked on that. When I was a graduate student, actually, I was an RA at the Minnesota Population Center, and we were working with this data. So I know it very well. We're creating this. I mean, yeah, reading I it in now it's much time. better than it was sometimes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Now much richer. Many more data sets are being read in. Absolutely. Great. OK, any other questions? I ask a quick clarifying question on your last point. I think with the dual, you know, where productivity might be heard if you're taking care of kids at the same time working from home, there's nothing like that in your model, right? There's no sort of penalty for at home working and childcare simultaneously in your current version of the model, correct? If I remember. Well, it's not like there is a penalty, but basically we're saying there's a hard constraint. Some fraction of your time you can work with children around at no cost, and then beyond that is impossible. So it's like doing, a hard cap, but up to that point, gap. there's no there's no cost on productivity or wage earnings or anything. Yeah, yeah, that's something I've been wanting to explore. My course co-authors thought it was too complicated, and not that important, but I'm still working on that. So let's see. And I'll go directly to the your end point, right? Where it, if there was that productivity cost or something that it could change norms, you're saying in a way that that decrease in inequality right. don't see in the long run. Okay, right. that makes sense. Yes, absolutely. Thanks. Michelle, if we have time, a last quick question about uh, the social norms. Now, in the paper, you take you know this exogenous change, but what do you think about you know for future research? What will be the determinants of these social norms? Something that might make those changes and dodges, dodges because this one might also explain why now we observe this penalty. So, what do you think about that? So, what we had in mind, what we meant to capture, and then never kind of fully closed it but was that the norms would be a frag, you know, a function of what people actually do. And so if, if you think, you know, you could have the social norms be a function of what fraction of fathers doing more childcare than mothers, for example, uh, so. or some other distribution of childcare. And then if the pandemic out of necessity switches more couples to what, for the fathers to be more involved, then that would change it endogenously. Now we didn't fully close it and just kind of hardwired it in, but that's sort of the idea. Um, it would be nice to see if there is something happening over time in the United States that might have, you know, changed and, you know, shaped the evolution of this social norm, as you're saying. No answer that. Anyway, thanks. Yeah. That's Great. I, I feel like I learned a lot and I don't have... Uh, I don't have great questions apart from having like absorbed a lot of a, a cool analysis that really explains something that makes a lot of sense. Are there any other questions? Awesome. Well, thank you so much for sharing your evening with us from Germany and and uh, we, we really appreciated the, the seminar. Thank you. Thanks so much for having me and for all this lively discussion. It was really fun. So thanks. And have a good day. I guess I'm going to go to sleep soon. So.
<laughs> Sleep well. <laughs> okay, bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you, Terry, for organizing this. Thanks for coming, Ali. Yeah. So I've been working with you, Terry, the entire pandemic, and I was, you know, with your kids. 